Abba Father, our Heavenly Father. So we just commit the whole morning to you, Lord, the whole day, and we just ask that you will have your way among us, Father. I just thank you that you are forever faithful, that you're always with us, and that you fulfill your word. So we just pray that by the power of your spirit, that you will quicken our minds and our ears and our eyes to see you, to hear you, and to understand you this morning as we come around your word. Now we come to worship you and thank you for who you are, for what you've done for us, and we just praise your holy name. In Jesus' name, amen. So it's over to you guys.
You're never, never, never gonna let us down You're never, never, never gonna let us down You're so good a better word and all the empty claims I've heard upon this earth speaks righteousness for me and stands in my defense Jesus it's your blood your blood speaks a better word all the empty claims I've heard upon this earth speaks righteousness for me stands in my defense Jesus it's your blood what can wash away our sins what can in grace tells of the Father's heart to make a way for us and boldly we approach not by earthly confidence it's only by your blood what can wash away our sins what can can 
And what can wash us pure as snow? Welcomed as the friends of God. Nothing but your blood. Nothing but your blood, King Jesus. Thank you for the blood.
sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. Win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. Almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. Shine in the shadows. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God and almighty fortress you go before us nothing can stand against the power of our God in the shadows you win every battle nothing can stand against the power of our God nothing nothing can stand Against the power of our God, nothing, nothing can stand against the power of our God. So when I fight, I fight on my knees, with my hands lifted high. Oh God, battle belongs to you. Every fear I lay at your feet, I sink through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. So when I fight, I fight on my knees, with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Every fear I lay at your feet, I sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. battle belongs to you. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. So we're going to read from um, 1 Corinthians, chapter 11 to verse 23. So if we just settle ourselves and think about what we are about to do when we break bread together. Paul here is talking to the church at Corinth, and it's relevant for each and every one of us. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you drink this bread and drink this, eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Now, I'm not sure who all is watching today, who all is joining in with us, but I would really encourage you to examine where you are in your faith in Jesus, in that you believe that everything he says here is for you, that you have made him Lord of your life. 
And it's important for us to do that so that we know that we are not going to be falling sick and fall asleep even before our time, as you will read in the following verses. So we need to really make sure that we're believing before we partake, that we believe in the Lord Jesus as the Lord of our lives, that we believe that he died for our sins, that we believe that he died and took our sicknesses, our sorrows, our griefs, our pains, and we are to examine ourselves in that faith. And the other thing I want to say, just in case someone is listening and saying, but I am not worthy. None of us are worthy, but he makes us worthy. So if you're feeling weak today and weak in your faith, this is the day that you're to take it because this is what strengthens us. An act that we do in faith to strengthen our belief. And the scripture says that he will even help us if we ask in our unbelief. But we have to ask for the help in our unbelief. So don't let any other teaching other than the apostles' teaching let us come boldly and partake of the table, because it is the Lord's table. So if you just take the bread, this is his body broken for us, and we're taking that bread in faith that our bodies have been made whole in the name of Jesus. And this cup is the cup of the new covenant in his blood. So we take that as the covering that releases us from sin. Hallelujah. We just thank you, Lord. We thank you, Father that your table is laden with good things. And we thank you, Father, that your son Jesus is coming back for us, his bride, his unblemished bride. So we look forward to that day, Lord. And we thank you that you have given us everything we need to stay strong and stay spotless by the blood of your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We just praise you and thank you this morning for your goodness towards us. Amen. Amen. We have been looking at um, the biblical foundations for the church over the last um, five weeks. And today we're going to be moving on to um, the building of the church, checking the living stones, and always remembering that Jesus is the cornerstone. So if you turn with me to Acts chapter 2, and we pick it up at verse 41. Then those who were gladly received his word were baptized. And that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common, and sold their possessions and goods, and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity 
of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Hallelujah. Well, don't you look forward to the day that we have all these people added to our church daily. It will happen. It will happen because God said it would. That we are coming into a time of great revival. And we need to be prepared. So we need to examine ourselves, examine these living stones that are the building on the foundation of the apostolic and prophetic fivefold ministry. And there's five elements in, in these verses that really hit me. And the first one was discipleship. Fortifying their faith, they continued steadfastly. They devoted themselves, it says in another translation, to the, apost the apostles' doctrine. Discipleship comes through study and acting on the word and mentoring one another. The second thing that hit me was ministry. They sold their, their possessions and goods and divided them all as anyone had a need. You know, without ministering to people and having relationship with them, we're never going to know where the need is. We're not going to know their individual needs. So how are we going to disperse and our, need, our talents, whatever that is? So we need to find our talents, even in the natural. The third one is worship, focusing on God, continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. They ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all people. So in the midst of everything, worship was continuing daily. And the fourth thing that hit me was fellowship. Facing life's problems together. They were devoting themselves to the apostles' doctrine together, facing all their difficulties together. Now, this wasn't just the 12. <laughs> this was, you know, further up in that chapter, there was 3,000 saved that day. So you, you can see how they must have divided and divvied things up between them, to encourage one another. Now, we tend to put a lot of um, emphasis on, you know, you have to be this, that, the next thing before you can do that, this and the next thing, you know. But there were obviously those who just caught the vision, ran with it, and were able to minister to a whole other group of people, out with the twelve because it wouldn't have been possible otherwise. But the fifth thing is that they fulfilled their mission. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. You know, it's, it's terrible really how we in the West have lost our way as far as these... Um, important elements have gone. We've gone as a church, we sometimes have reduced it all to just turning up on a Sunday. Everything is about the church building, physical building of bricks and mortar. Others have said, oh, we don't need the bricks and mortar, we just need to go from house to house. And we try and maybe do a little bit of a hybrid of both, and we're kind of constantly missing the point. <laughs> because they did both daily. They met in the temple 
and they went from house to house. So we're going to home in today on that fourth element of fellowship, sharing life together. You know, we've touched on the discipling throughout the teaching over the last four weeks and ministry or evangelism, you know. So we're going to focus really today on fellowship. Because fellowship can mean many things to many people. We can be having fellowship, just having a coffee with one another. We'll be having fellowship when we come to, to worship him together. We can be having fellowship and having a more structured um, meeting midweek in someone's home. You know, there's, there's a mixture of all things that make up fellowship. But there's one thing that's got to be there in the first place. And it's got to be right. And it's got to have, the, we all have to have the right relationship with God to be able to bring others in to the fold, so to speak. So we need to be doing life together. The, the, the Greek for, um, for fellowship is kononia, which means shared. So we're sharing our lives with one another. And it means that there is nothing that we go through, but there's always somebody else to be there with us. It's about having the good times together and having the bad times together. So the idea of fellowship is best expressed in the one another's of the Bible. So how does it happen? What does it look like? Well, it looks like a lot of different things that we have very often thought it was just the minister or the pastor who was to do these things. But I'm going to give you a list of examples from my own experience of before I became a pastor and since I became a pastor. They're real people, real situations, but the names have changed. So <laughs> I don't want you thinking, you know, is that so and so or is that so? Because many of them have got nothing to do with our church here. <laughs> so, but one of these examples is Sandra was ill transfer to another hospital that was out of town. People from the church made the long trip to be with her, to pray with her, and it wouldn't have been a one-off event. It would have been a regular visit, regardless of the distance. Now, that is fellowship. That is shared hurt. And in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 18, we're told to therefore comfort one another. When someone is in that kind of crisis, it's important to comfort, to bring comfort. Another one, Mike had a huge fight with his wife, called a man from the church, they sat together, talked it through, prayed, asking God for strength to be able to apologize, do the right thing, in the future, and that's fellowship. Hebrews 10 verse 24 says, Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Now, we need to take that to heart seriously. It's to stir up love and good works. So many of us can be hindered by shame, by feeling not good enough, by feeling embarrassed about how we've behaved or, or, or even how somebody else has behaved towards us. Why do we do that? Because very often we've been used to getting a real lecture or being judged as being whatever, you know. So it stops us from being real and honest with one another. But the purpose for doing it is to stir up love, not judgmentalism or lecturing, 
but to stir up love and good works. Dan struggled with pornography for a long time. He'd been in church for a long time, but now he wants to put things right. He's realizing that this is something that is not acceptable. So what is he supposed to do with that? He confesses it to another in the church. And rather than being horrified and lecturing Dan, again, he's helped through prayer. Accountability. Weekly meeting to help him make progress. That's fellowship. Shared struggle. James 5, verse 16 says, Confess your faults to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Jane was lonely, being single again. It wasn't very easy. She sat by the phone, felt lost, tearful. The phone rings, and it was Barbara from the church saying, I'm just going to be calling by. I'm going for a walk. Do you like to join me? And we'll drop in for a coffee at this new place. Jane smiles for the first time in weeks. That's fellowship. Shared time. So many things that we can do to serve one another. Remember one guy being, not being able to, to been out of work for a while, trying to get back on his feet, got a job, needed money for his lunch and all different things and struggled to get everything together. Somebody else who was going his way says, oh, I'll give you a lift to work. So that released him from having to get buses and what have you. Serving one another. Loving one another. All of these examples, as I've said, are real people. The names are changed, but are real people with real problems and real fellowship there to help them face life problems. You know, if that's the kind of church that we're to be, we're all to be like that. And I really am I'm, I'm grateful and I'm thankful that in this part of his vineyard, we are like that. We do care for one another, but we can always improve and always get to know each other better. But as I said earlier, and I'll come back to it again at the end of, of the message, is that we start with a relationship with God. The basis of fellowship is very simple. We see ourselves as forgiven. We see ourselves as the person we're ministering to, who has given their lives to the Lord as forgiven. We love Jesus and we're obeying him. 1 John chapter 1, verse 7 says, But we walk in the light as he is in the light. We have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. Walking in the light simply means obeying God's word. So the foundation is being forgiven from all sin. That takes away the shame. It takes away the embarrassment. And we are free to repent, to just turn around from whatever our struggles are, knowing that we're not being judged, but we are being supported. That is what is so, so important. And some of us start from a wrong basis. We want the fellowship and the kinship, but I'm really willing to live that real relationship with God. And we see it, unfortunately, you know, where people struggle, and they really struggle. We've just, we've seen it this morning, where someone is really, really struggling against all odds. But there isn't that real willingness to have that real relationship with Christ daily. And it's not because of 
lack of of fellowship. It it may be just now because of lockdown, but you know this has been going on for years. <laughs> so we c it's not because of lack of support. It's because the foundation to the fellowship. One party is not fully committed to having that real relationship. So we ask for forgiveness and we choose, sh we choose to show him love by following him daily. And it is a choice because there are so many distractions in our lives that it's, it, we can easily be just swept away. So we choose to show love by following him daily. The second thing that is important in fellowship is sharing our time. All who believed were together and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food. Now, I'll be honest, <laughs> I find this a hard one. One of the toughest sharing time. We're all so busy. Ministry can consume you to the point that you're being swept aside with the good works. But we have to make time. You know, we have work, family, appointments, cars got to go to the garage, this got to be done, the gardens to be done, the housework's to be done. You know, there's so much in life that needs doing that there's very little time to catch up with one another and have fellowship. Now we can just make that call just to check on someone, invite someone for lunch, even if it's just a cup of coffee on the go while you have a walk and a, and a peace. <laughs> to take time to pray with someone. You know, attend the midweek meetings. The meetings are varied so that there's something hopefully there that anyone and everyone might like to join in. Bible study nights, prayer and praise nights, reflection and unpacking Sunday service. There's multiple meetings available, even in the lockdown period, where we can join on Zoom and not leave the comfort of our own couch. But we have to make time share time with one another. And until we share our time, we will have a hard time feeling that we're real part of the church. It takes sacrifice to change, to share our time. But the fellowship is worth it. It's always worth it. And it's, you know, everything over lockdown is all on screen, and I fully appreciate that it can be a bit much, because there are many nights that I think, I've, I don't want to sit in front of this thing another night. Because <laughs> every night of the week, as well as during the day, there's meetings, and they're all in this little box in front of me. But you know, when you have that fellowship time, you come away feeling so much better than when you've not had it. And the third thing, last but not least, is opening our heart with gladness and simplicity of heart. They had nothing to hide from each other. They were glad to be together and didn't have to make it all complicated. They were sincere and honest. If you are guarding yourself and trying to be something you're not, <laughs> you'll never experience true fellowship. You know, I, I remember when we had our testimony nights at CAST um, before all this madness happened, and there was a real evidence of that realness. We just shared our experiences as they were didn't try and make ourselves look good or show off our knowledge or whatever different things we kind of can fall into 
we were honest with each other, where we had come from and how God had intervened and brought us out of it. And, there's, and it cemented a bond between that group that shared that honestly. That you couldn't always maybe share in a public arena, but you can share it in fellowship, because fellowship is shared. Because if you're not having someone who's holier than thou saying, mm, look at him or look at her, and you know, they came from and did, 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 did. And then people get known by their past. Even if you've only met them two weeks before that, you'll always think of them as, oh, that's so-and-so who went to jail for so-and-so or whatever. You know, instead of having that honesty about yourself. I'm no better than that person. And you share that with the other person. So you're on equal ground. Situations, circumstances are different. But at the cross, it's level ground. And not one person is better than the other. So God gets the glory in all of it. And, I, you know, it's, it's so, so important to do that. Because it's okay to not be okay. <laughs> you know, I'm not okay, you're not okay, but together we can help each other to be okay. Because we can face life's problems together. It's probably the hardest one of all, is having nothing to hide. You know, I, um, I got saved and I went to Al-Anon within weeks of one another. And part of my testimony is that, you know, God led me to Al-Anon. And if you're not sure what Al-Anon is, it's a fellowship that is there to support um, people's lives who have been affected by other people's alcoholism. And it's, you know, and my testimony is and will always be that God led me to Al-Anon and through the 12 steps of Al-Anon led me to God. Because there I found men and women who were in similar situations. They either had fathers or partners or siblings or children who were alcoholic and how that behavior impacted on them and how we all behaved in similar ways but different ways that helped and enabled the alcoholic to carry on doing whatever they were doing. So, <laughs> but there was no condemnation in that group. I could share honestly when I lost it, I could share when how many bottles I put down, poured down the sink. You know, and, and nobody was going to go and talk to everybody else about it. There was no gossip out with the group. It was a safe place. And I'm sorry to say that very often church is not a safe place. And church should be a safe place. But it can only be a safe place if we, the living stones, examine ourselves and have ourselves in line with the word of God and how God wants us to be. And if we are to follow his vision for us, you know, we're, we're blessed in being part of a church that has a very individual prophetic vision that has been given to the church and its leaders historically. It's not just something new that just happened when I came to Tain. This was a prophetic word about, I don't know, 20 years beforehand or something. The vision sets out the destination and the prophetic culture 
in the church helps generate energy to move forwards towards that. So it's exciting. It's not just having a little reunion every Sunday morning and not seeing each other for the rest of the week. <laughs> you know, there's an excitement about coming together and working towards this vision. Why it's so important for us this year to have been revisiting the vision. And if you listen to, to Donnie's Sunday services, you will hear that. And, uh, and, and revisiting the, the foundations of, for that vision. And I just want to, to close really with a very short illustration, which I thought was lovely. And we were just having a wee chat beforehand, and it's, it's certainly obviously something that's on God's heart. We were talking earlier about um, children with special needs. And um, this is a, a, a lovely story I'd read years ago somewhere, I can't remember where, but it was the Special Needs um, Olympics. And during the race, one child falls and scrapes his knee and starts crying. All the kids stopped and came back and gathered round this little boy, helped him up and walked together across the finish line. Walked with him, helped him along across the finish line. The crowd went nuts. You can imagine why. Because life was about something more than competition. It stopped being a race. It stopped being the Olympics. It just became life, sharing together, supporting together, helping one another, picking up the one that was hurting. You know, life is more than a race. It's more than a weekly reunion. It's about facing life's problems together, picking one up that has tripped, and showing love and saying, let's walk together to the finish line. So the invitation this morning, and I said she had come back to this before we finished, is that you know, if there's anybody who's been listening to this message this morning and has not made that first step in having the relationship right with God. Today's the day to do it. Get your relationship right with God because he has a good future for you, an amazing future for you. If you find it difficult to make that step, and you need support in making it, well, you know where I am if you're local, and if you're not local, you'll find all my details on the website. So we need to come together and do life together. So we're going to leave it there, and Andrew and Clee are going to um, lead us in another song, and Ingrid is going to close in prayer. Bless you. your eyes to the heavens then look upon the earth beneath over the hills along the valleys what do you see in the wilderness can you see Eden on the barren land, the garden of the Lord? And all along the banks of 
a beautiful river I see the good fruit grow Lift up your eyes Lift up your eyes To the heavens Then look upon The earth beneath Over the hills And along the valleys what do you see? And in the wilderness Can you see Eden? And on the barren land The garden of the Lord And all along the banks Of the beautiful river I see the good fruit grow Can you hear the breeze in the tops of the balsam trees? Hear the marching sound advancing all around. And I'm calling you. Come on, break through, break through. This is your time to arise. Arise, arise. Rise, rise. So lift up your eyes to the heavens, then look upon the earth beneath over the hills along the valleys what do you see what do you say in the wilderness can you see Eden and on the barren land the garden of the Lord and all along the bank of the beautiful river to see the good fruit grow and can you hear the breeze in the tops of the balsam trees hear the marching sound advancing all around I'm calling you come on break through break through this is your time to arise. And can you hear the breeze in the tops of the balsam trees? Hear the marching sound advancing all around. I'm calling you. Come on, break through, break through. This is your time to your time to arise this is your time to arise Father, we just thank you for this morning. We thank you for the opportunity to come together and to worship you. And we just thank you for your word to us this morning, Lord. And we just, we want to make you a priority in our lives. Our relationship with you comes first, Lord. But we want to also just seek to fellowship with one another better, Lord. So just help us and show us ways we can reach out to one another and just be a support um, to your body. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> 